I'm so thankful to be able to share ministry with people at Wyuka. Equally mindful of the ministry of Brian Franklin and Grace Freeman in recent weeks. These gifted, called people have blessed our church, and I'm very thankful for that. Leonard Sweet, an, uh, an observer of, of culture, he's, he's a pastor and writer. He made this comment. In the most connected, plugged in, wired culture in the history of the world, we are feeling isolated, lost, unloved, and unvalued. Mac McCarter, who is a community activist in Shreveport, Louisiana, believes that our collective estrangement has had a corrosive and crippling effect on our culture. He says we have become a cut flower civilization. Cut flowers look beautiful, but they have no root, and the blooms can fade. For Christians, we can't afford to be a cut flower community, for we have to remember the essential nature of the root. To what, to whom are we connected? Today we begin a series on what it means to be a connected community. If you have your worship guide with you this morning, I want you to look at the front of it. And I want you to notice the phrases there. Just under the name of our church, there are three phrases, loving God, connecting people, changing lives. And I would submit to you that the third is absolutely impossible, not certainly in the way we would want, if the first two are not bridged. In other words, it begins with loving Christ. It begins with a relationship with the Lord, for that's why we're here. And out of that love for Jesus, out of that love for our Lord, then we find a reason to belong to one another. In this sanctuary, I look around, I see how spread out we are. You know how I feel about that. It doesn't seem to matter because you still sit where I need binoculars to find out what you're up to back there. But I watch you during our greeting time, and I realize that for some of us, we don't, we don't like that because we have to touch people, and it's just not our thing. I, I get that. But it's a powerful symbol. It's a symbol of connection. You know, our, our lives have changed a lot through the years. We, we just, we did have a, a wonderful deacon's retreat this weekend. Peter Ray Jones, who is a friend of Wyuka. Longtime pastor at First Decatur. Seminary professor. And all, you know, just so many different ways he's touched so many lives. But he, he was reminiscing about his childhood growing up in West Tennessee in a rural setting and he asked the deacons a question. He said, uh, you remember porches, front porches? I don't know how many of you have a front porch. But these days, we don't have front porches as much as we now have back decks. You know that? Front porches were connecting points. Well, the family could go out and sit, perhaps, catch up with each other. But in a lot of cases, it was a place where neighbors gathered. People would drop by. It's changed, hasn't it? Now we, we moved to the back where we don't have to deal with those neighbors. 
have our own little private place. It begins this way. We pull up in our cars, come to the driveway, hit a button, garage door goes up, we disappear. We can pick up an electronic device as some of you are doing right now in worship. And I know some of you are looking at the Bible because you have it right there, but others of you are doing naughty things. You heard the story of the the dad who was driving his two kids to school. And the two kids were in the back. They were texting each other, sitting right beside each other. Dad says, "What, what are you doing? Why are you texting each other? We don't want you to hear what we're saying. (laughs) In the New Testament, we have letters written by a man who felt a little disconnected. What he really wanted to do was to travel. I don't know why you'd want to travel. Not like Paul did. Oh my goodness, you read the stories and you understand the hardships he endured. But there came a time in his life when he couldn't do that anymore. He was kept from doing that. And he felt isolated from those mission outposts, many of the churches that he had helped to start. And the letters that we have are his reaching out, trying to stay connected. We don't think he ever visited Colossae. Colossae was a city in Asia Minor, sort of a triangle of cities around. Hierapolis and Laodicea were the other two. Colossae at one time was a bustling, active place. It had, it had lost a lot of that vitality and in fact was starting to die. The church in Colossae was... Not one of Paul's plants. He didn't start that church. But somebody that he mentored started that church. A man by the name of Epaphras. And these four, four short chapters reflect Paul's desire to connect with a group of people with whom he shared Not the kind of personal relationship he might have had with the Philippians or some of the others. But what he shared with them was the root, the foundation, the reason, the purpose. You see, what had happened in that culture happens in just about every culture. The message starts changing and for the Christian message to change there's problems and Paul recognized that that in the church there were there were things that were beginning to creep in and the gospel was being distorted watered down compromised and Paul wouldn't let that happen if he could prevent it and so he wrote these letters these um, Chapters, we call them chapters. This letter found in your New Testament, the book of Colossians. So we're going to start where we ought to start. But actually, there are two places to start. One is in the Gospel of John. And I want you to notice some similarities here. I want to read just a couple of verses there. I'm reading from the New Living Translation, John chapter 1. First few verses. In the beginning, the word already existed. He was with God and he was God. He was in the beginning with God. He created everything there is. Nothing exists that he didn't make. Life itself was in him, and this life gives light to everyone. Now, if you would, turn with me to Colossians. If you're not quite sure where Colossians is, you haven't found it yet, You keep going through the Gospels and Acts and Romans and Corinthians, and you're going to get to four, let's call the epistles, the prison epistles, 
Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, and Colossians. Chapter 1, beginning in verse 15. Christ is the visible image of the invisible God. He existed before God made anything at all and is supreme over all creation. Christ is the one through whom God created everything in heaven and earth. He made the things we can see and the things we cannot see. Kings, kingdoms, rulers, and authorities, everything has been created through him and for him. He existed before everything else began and he holds all creation together. I would tell you today that there is no reason at all for you to be here. If you do not understand, if we do not grasp, if we do, do not believe that Christ is first and foremost, that he is indeed supreme over all things. I remember years ago in Jacksonville, Florida, somebody erected a billboard and it said, Jesus is Lord over Jacksonville. You can imagine the controversy. Because not everybody's a Christian, right? Right? Not everybody believes that. Some people have other faiths and others don't have any faith at all. And that's, you just shouldn't put that thing up there. Well, maybe the billboard should, should go. But the truth remains. At the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow, every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. So if you've got an argument... Here it is. Christ. The creator of the world created the church. A connected community. It was intentional. It didn't just happen. Upon this rock, the confession of faith. That core belief that Jesus is indeed who he said he was, who the scripture proclaims him to be. Upon this rock, I will build my church. Words of Jesus, and all the powers of hell will not conquer it. These days it seems like the powers of hell are particularly active. But hear me. It is still true. I will build my church and the powers of hell will not conquer it. And then Paul writes to the Colossians, this same good news that came to you is going out all over the world. What does that tell us? It tells us that we're part of something huge. The most important adventure in all the world. The most important movement in all of history. Now I want to connect some things. On the back of your worship guide, there are some bullet points for the message today. And I just want to reflect on that because... In just a few moments, we're going to do something that we get to do as a community that's awfully special. You and I are part of communities different ways. Maybe our neighborhood, maybe our office, our our class at school, our team. could be any number of things. A lot of different kinds of community. There's some things that help to shape community, whatever, wherever we find it. Normally, a community is, is shaped when we have something in common. There's a reason for us to gather, to meet, to attempt to accomplish certain things. There's a reason that holds us together. We share similar values. If we don't, we go find a group that does. That happens in church. We like this church, or we like this preacher, we like this program, we like this, and then something changes, so we go somewhere else. It happens. But what holds us together are things that we, we believe. And it isn't necessary that, or, or, or necessarily true that we believe everything the same. It, it isn't that, there, that there's so much conformity as there is a sense of harmony and unity. Those are precious words in community. Common unity, community. We are committed to a cause. We hope to get something done. We want to accomplish something. 
to meet just to meet. That's insane. You ever felt that way? We have a meeting. Well, why are we have a meeting? Because we have a meeting. We're supposed to be at a meeting. Some of us define our life at church. Go to meetings. My oldest son was just a little guy, Sunday school. They had a question for the children there, the boys and girls. The question was, what does your dad do? You know what my son said? He goes to meetings. That was a dagger in the heart. Because that's what I communicated to him. I'm the pastor of a church. I go to meetings. So if you hold a meeting and I don't come, you'll know why. I think there's something more to that. Because community, we're, we're drawn by relationships. Today, we honor our deacon ministry and we focus on three men and their families who have been selected by this church to serve in a very, very important role. And that role is not meetings. It's not directors. It's not a board of directors. There is no support in Scripture for a board of deacons. The first deacons were assigned a menial job to help build community among the church. Because a complaint had arisen. And some people felt left out. Some people felt like they were discriminated against. And the apostles said, that's not right. We're going to keep focusing on the things that God's called us to do. But we need to appoint some people to take care of this. Because the unity and harmony, the community of this church is too precious to harm we are drawn by relationships. Some of you have been a member of a Sunday school class. We call them covenant groups now. But you've been a member of that group for, well, since Noah got off the boat. Relationships. When it all comes down to it. There's nothing more important than relationships. And where do relationships happen? Well, they happen really well in community. And so what's unique about a a community that's connected? Well, if you follow those next four bullets, you'll associate them with the four that are before it. We have something in common. We have been adopted into the same family. We are brothers and sisters in Christ. We are family. There's not a person in this room who deserves to be in this family. Not one of us. God chose us. He brought us into the fold. He included us into the family. He has a pretty high opinion of you, so much so that he wants to include you, adopt you. We listened to a man yesterday in the service honoring Floyd Moody, Floyd and Peggy's son, who was adopted. He said, I, I was adopted. And I, he went on to talk about how it felt to be chosen and what it meant to be in that family and to have a man like Floyd to be his father. For us, our similar values come down to this. Our values are shaped by our faith in Christ. Now there are things that we might disagree about, and that's what Baptists do, we disagree. Three Baptists, four opinions, we all understand that. But at the heart of it all, there is Christ. Christ above all. The third point, we have accepted the commission to speak and live the gospel. That relates to we are committed to a cause. If we are not committed to a cause, why are we here? I really don't think any of us want to just simply occupy space. There's got to be more to it. 
something more noble. And finally, we are drawn by relationships. Because God is our Father, we are indeed family. Paul will say, and this is, I believe, an inescapable truth, that Christ is the head of the body, the church. I like that because it takes a lot of pressure off those who sometimes claim they're in charge. Pastors are guilty of that. Other leaders can be guilty of that in church. When we recognize, hey, we're all parts of the body, He's the only one capable, worthy. So let's just settle that now, and let's find where we are to function, and let's get to it. So each of us in this room, if we're a part of this body, you have a stake. You have an investment. How are you handling your investment? What are you doing to help this body get healthy? Look around. I'm not talking about numbers. We all would like to have more. More in the plate, more in the pew. You know, we can talk about that. But what is it that you do that makes this sweeter, deeper, better? just a few moments we're going to we're going to bless some people and before we do that I want to tell a real quick story and we're I want to try try to be mindful so we have time to do what we need to do it's about a couple they lived out in California his name was Richard her name was Geneva Richard was a farmer must be really tough I you know some of you understand this but he used up all his credit he got in trouble the credit bureau shut him down took everything he lost his land he lost his buildings he lost his equipment he lost his home everything was gone he and Geneva didn't know where their next meal would come from And that's when family and friends and church made such a difference for them. And they made it. It wasn't easy, but they made it. He was offered a job about a year later. They began to work at a hunting preserve out in Northern California. Things had turned around for them, and they were doing pretty well. And he got a phone call. It was from the the manager of that credit bureau, he said, can I, can I come out and, and, and talk to you in Geneva? Richard said, well, we'll, we'll come in. We'll, we don't mind driving in. He said, no, no, I, I really, I want to come to you. He said, okay. This is how the conversation went. He said, I want to ask you something personal. A friend of mine recently lost everything he owned. His wife committed suicide. It was a wreck. It was a ruin. And people at my office, they noticed things, and they, they saw this tragedy unfold, and they remembered. We've been talking about this, and I just had to find out from you. I want to know how you handled your crisis. It seemed to be different than some of the others, some of the stories that didn't turn out well at all. How did you do it? It opened the door for these two people to talk about their root system. They talked about their family, and they talked about their church. They said, but first and foremost, we serve a God who didn't abandon us and would never forsake us. We knew we were going to be fine. We knew everything would work out. We didn't know how it would. But whatever came, he was our strength. He was our reason. 
So friend, family, how connected are we to Christ? And how connected are we to his body? Paul thought it was important enough to write to these Christians who were struggling to remind them of some eternal truths and to remind them that as a family, the head of that family loved them so much that he would never abandon them or forsake them, whatever came. We have a great God. And you know what? We get to serve him together. These next few moments are precious to us for we ordain, set apart, and bless those who have been asked to serve in the ministry of the deacon. And over these next few moments, I want you to listen to some of our leaders as they speak to us. First, Bob Freeman, who has served as the chairman of our deacon body this year. And then Helen Bottoms, who will chair our deacon body in the year to come. Bob, would you come share with us, please?